Um, but you were the jury foreman, correct? How'd that happen? Yeah, I don't, it, I think it, I became the jury foreman just by virtue of towards the end there, we needed somebody to read it. And I said, I don't have a problem doing that. You know, I, I can read the verdict. So I don't think it was necessarily from my recollection that I was a foreman and trying to keep order the whole time. Mm -hmm. It was just more towards the end there. They said, hey, somebody's gotta be able to read this. So again, this was 20 years ago, and I don't expect you to remember all the details, but there's probably some things that maybe stuck out in your mind. What are some of the things that stuck out in your mind about that trial? Uh, I can tell you honestly, it was one of the most stressful events that I'd ever done in my life, even to, to this point, you know, and I've been to war since then. Um, it, it was extremely stressful because you go into it thinking that you're gonna, that it's gonna be like TV, you know, they're gonna give you all this great evidence and everything's gonna be right in front of you. It's gonna be really easy. You're gonna make the decision and you're gonna go about your day. Um, and, and that definitely wasn't the case. You know, there was a lot left unsaid and a lot of speculation I think that had to be done because of, of what was unsaid. Uh, and, and I think we did the best we could with what we were presented, um, which was really a lot just on the, on the part of the prosecution. Right. So what made it so stressful? Was it because you knew that you had these guys basically <coughs> their future in your hand? Yeah, I mean, it goes both ways. It was either we had their future in our hands versus we were going to let two guys out that killed a 13-year-old kid, you know, and, and, and that, that's kind of that weight and balance that we had there is, is not knowing, like, you know, I don't know, just, just knowing that, that it's such a big decision. And I don't think anybody took the decision lately. Um, the jury swayed a lot. Like we, you know, we were all the way, everybody but two this way, everybody but two this way, you know, and, and at one point we even asked the judge, you know, hey, when is this a hung jury? Like when, when can we say we cannot come to a decision? Yeah, and that was after like 18 hours or something like that. And, and the judge said, you guys need to go back in and try to get a verdict. Yeah, and if I remember, it was still a whole nother day after that. And I mean, it, it's an extremely, like, you don't think about it like debating somebody for 30 minutes on something that you may or may not be passionate about is exhausting. But doing it for eight hours for three days, you know, or, or whatever it ended up being, I know it was a lot. Um, unbelievably exhausting like just it just takes everything out of you because it, you know it's again we didn't have everything we felt like we would have needed but we didn't want to make the wrong decision All right what did you want I, I think more than anything we wanted to hear from them we wanted to know like like where's the alibi well if they're if they didn't give us an alibi they must not have one or where's the Where's the, anything about these guys, like we knew nothing about them. The only, everything we had was, was one guy saying, hey, these two guys that I'm friends with and somebody who came in and said that, but then was scared of them is what we thought, um, uh, saying these guys did it. And then a bunch of experts coming in saying his story matches up with the evidence that we've seen. So, so what we didn't have is anything from the other side, to be honest, it, it seemed mm -hmm. like the entire defense was was this guy's a liar don't believe him so you heard carl's alibi do you believe that it would have changed anything if he would have got up in the stand and, and repeated that alibi I, I think it would have helped i mean i don't know what else would have came out you know I, mm -hmm. I know there's some other things that maybe they didn't want to come out mm -hmm. you know in these guys past but um i don't think it could have hurt him at all right um the fact that we didn't get anything from him, I think hurt him more than anything. Right. Now the judge actually told you that um, you can't consider the fact that these guys did not testify. You cannot use that against them. Is Absolutely. that the case though? <laughs> I mean, I, I think it was definitely the case. I, I don't know that it was, you know, maybe not directly, hey, they're guilty because they didn't say anything, but I'm sure it was taken into consideration that we, the absence of having something is a negative. Right. You know, so maybe not directly, oh, you know, they didn't testify, so they must be hiding something um, to more as if something was there, we probably would have heard it. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's you know, because it, I guess in my thought, and I think a lot of people that aren't in this experience, they're like, man, if someone accused me of killing someone, I'd be screaming at the top of my lungs. And, and I believe that was my, one of my exact quotes. I mean, even you saying that. You know, it was it, it, you really do? You take it, it you, you know, you, you take it into consideration. You really do. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, on the same note, uh, when the, the girlfriend was going to testify and then she did it, you know, they came back afterwards and say, okay, forget everything you heard. Well, yeah, I'm sorry, you don't forget everything you heard. I mean, she's the only one that said these guys were friends, they hung out, and then she left. And, you know, I, I believe our assumption at the time was, well, obviously she's scared of these guys and that's not why she's testifying. Now, since reading everything, you know, that you were able to provide me with, you know, 20 years later, that wasn't the case. You know, that was definitely a false impression on our part that I think definitely didn't help them. Yeah. So, I mean, you think if she wasn't there at all, if that could have swayed? I mean, could that have made oh, a difference? Oh, absolutely. I mean, she, her, her not wanting to testify and her, um, you know, the, the few comments that did get out while she was in there definitely hurt them. Even though the judge said, you guys got to pretend she wasn't here. Again, you you can't pretend that you know. I know you're humans. And I mean, I'd be, when you're you arguing, can't. when you're arguing, and you're you're talking about something for that long, um, you know, everything came out like mm -hmm. everything. So, what was it like when you first went back into the jury room? I mean, were people? And I don't even know if you can say what the vote was, but were people? convince one way or another or was well, is everybody like well let's talk about this and go over the evidence or were what what do you think the vote was i think if i remember correctly it went in there split right down the middle it really did and like i said it you know it points it swayed 80 percent one way it points it swayed 80 percent the other way and it and it just came down to to having the discussion you know let's say that that you know most were on this side then then it was okay well what's what's holding you back or vice versa when it went the other way well what's holding you back so then we would argue that one point of you know maybe okay well if this is what's holding you back then what about this this and this because that's what i heard or that's what i have in my notes you know we'd go back over and kind of correlate what we heard what notes we took um and try and you know maybe you know people would integrate personal experiences or you know or just talk about you know why they felt a certain way um, and then have an open discussion about that. Right. And I think everybody was amazed and impressed by the fact that you guys deliberated for 26 hours. Yeah, it and was the, insane. The, like, and, and the trial itself probably only lasted like 10 hours or something like that. If that, yeah. I mean, it, that's, that's exactly it. Like, I remember we deliberated three times as long as the trial. Um, in hindsight, you know, that itself sends a message to me. Mm -hmm. And I, and you know, if I had any regrets, that would probably be the one thing, like, like just maybe understanding reasonable doubt a little bit better. Because now I would say, yeah, I have a reasonable doubt now, but at the time I didn't feel like I did. Well, because you weren't given anything. I think you had told me before that you just thought there was more to the story. Absolutely. I mean, that's that that's probably the biggest thing that that plays in my mind is you know. Like I said, you think that it's going to be just like TV. You're going to go in there and they're going to give you, well, now, you know, here's the DNA and here's the, the video evidence from around the corner and here's three people who said where they were and here's their history and here's all this stuff and everything's going to be right there and you're going to have an educated decision based on facts. And and I, I really feel like our decision was, you know, made on on one person saying, hey, they were there and then the evidence saying, yeah, his story makes sense because... It matches up scientifically with everything he said and nobody saying any different mm. you know so talk about Travis's testimony obviously you knew that he had accepted a plea from the state you knew that he was a bad man so just talk about your thoughts like when you saw him or were listening to him yeah so I mean it, we had no doubts that he, he definitely wasn't a good guy but we assumed that all three of them were not you know without having any background on the other two um, there was a lot of assumption there that like, hey, these, you know, all three of these guys have been involved in stuff. Um, and it's not just one guy that might be a liar. It's a whole bunch of people that could be liars. So, so we knew that what was brought into question was like, okay, not necessarily is this guy a liar? Because even on the stand, he was kind of shaky. And some of the things he said was kind of shaky. It was, it was, is he lying about this? And, and that's where... I think a lot of you know them bringing in the experts to back up what he was saying lended truth to what he was saying. Without the experts, I don't know that we would have believed him. But having the experts there saying, you know, the coroner saying, yeah, those are the wounds that happened, or having, you know, the the expert come in and say, yeah, that's that's what happened. 
you know, adding those experts in to back up this guy mm -hmm. made him a whole lot more believable. And and nobody denying that, you know. Mm -hmm. We took it into consideration like, hey, if there's a chance that this isn't true, why is there nobody here arguing it? Right. And that's on all of it, you know, on everything. There was nothing presented on the other side other than this guy's a liar. And to be honest, reading even reading back through the transcripts, that wasn't done very well. It was confusing, it jumped around, you know, so even rereading it after having lived it, it still doesn't make sense on, on how they defended these guys. Right. You obviously would have liked for the defense to put on a defense rather than having a closing statement and we rest our case. A absolutely. I mean, there was no defense. You know, there, there was no defense. And, and, and that's a lot of, I think, why we found it the way we did is, is there, was, there wasn't any defense. Right. So when you guys came out and you had asked the judge, <clears throat> you know what makes a hung jury, you know, can we, we were hung. What, what was the vote at that point? How many people were kind of holding up the whole thing? I want to say maybe three. Maybe three were holding out and saying, I just don't think that, I just don't think that we have enough here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't say for sure. I really can't speak for anybody else that was there. No, yeah, and to be honest, I'm just speaking at the best of my recollection because mm -hmm. this was a long time ago. But let me ask you this, though. If there were like three people and the judge said, no, you guys have to go back in there and reach a decision. Do you think at some point, and again, I understand you're not speaking, but I'm just thinking human nature. I'm thinking that, well, at some point you're just going to say, oh my God, maybe these people are right. I mean, you think some people just gave in just to have it over with? I, I would hate to speak for somebody else, and I really don't want to. Yeah. I, I don't even okay. want to make a guess on that, to be honest. I can tell you this. We were all very burnt out. We were all very tired of arguing. But, but given the people in that room, I don't think that anybody made the decision based on being tired, no. Right. What was the one piece of, if there's even one piece, what was the one thing that you kind of clung to, whether it was them not testifying, or whether it was Chandrea, whether it was the experts? Me personally, it was the experts. It was that, the fact that, that this guy said this is what was done, here's the experts backing it up. And, and, and honestly, a big part of me personally was there is, if there was something else, they'd be giving it to us. So there must not be nothing proving they're innocent. There's lots of stuff proving they're guilty. Right. Um, now, I think at, at one point, when you guys, I don't know if you were ever, <coughs> the jury wasn't in the room at that point, but at one point, Wayne kind of lost it. They had taken him back, you guys were deliberating. He lost it. He, I think a couple of deputies were injured. And did, was he ever in the courtroom, like in cuffs while you guys were there? Uh, not that I recall. I mean, when he lost it was at the end after the verdict was read. Yeah. So, so that's when, that's when he lost it. They kind of rushed everybody out of the room. Um, you know, that was extremely chaotic. Yeah. So what was your thought whenever all that was going down? I, honestly, I was just, I was just ready to go at that point. Um, I don't know that I, you know, that that, that, that really spoke to me either way. It was, mm -hmm. it, it was what it was at that point. The decision had been made and, and, you know, and we were just confident we made the right decision at that point. Right. So you have had a chance to, look, I'm not trying to get you to say anything here, but you have had a chance to read, like, some of the things you didn't see. Some of the police reports, some of you saw some of the stuff. How does any of that make you feel? Does it just make you feel like I wish I would have seen it? Yeah, like I said, I I don't regret my decision. I think I made and the others made the best decision given what we were given at the time. However, having read back through everything, seeing the recanning and testimony, um, seeing some of the things that weren't presented back then. Uh, some of the evidence that's missing, you know, finding out about a lot of different things. Uh, I personally w would love to see them get another opportunity to plead their case. Um, I think they were given a fair trial based on what was presented, but I think that there's there's a good chance that maybe not everything that was there that should have been. Right. Um, you know, and part of it, uh, <coughs> when I agreed to take this up, you know, the whole Central Park Five thing was coming out and. Um, when they see this or whatever, the documentary on Netflix, and if you haven't seen that, it's really cool. 
I mean, it's not cool, it's terrifying, but it's really well done. And I'm not even using any of this, I'm just talking to you at this point. Is that it really, it's kind of scared me just when, thinking about the jury, not the jury, but the judicial system. How, I mean, it's scary. <laughs> It it's is. Scary. I mean, I, I think, in, you know, and something we didn't say there is, you know, the, the fact that this was a 13-year-old kid came into play, like, they brought his clothes in and laid them out on the table in front of the jury. I mean, you could see it was a little kid that was killed. So, like I said, we were deciding, like, are we going to, is there enough there? You know, I, I know it's innocent until proven guilty, but, you know, we were potentially letting off two guys that killed a 13-year-old. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we took into consideration. You know, this wasn't a normal crime. This was a little bit more brutal than normal. Yeah. And I'm sure they showed you all the pictures, the videotape of the cake tape of the crime scene. And it, the clothes is what really sticks out to me was bringing the clothes in there in the bag and just and leaving them out there. Like that's that's the one thing that sticks out to me the most. Were they bloody or just because you could see? No, they were bloody and it was the size, the size, just the size is what stuck out to me a lot. Just that it was, you know, that it was not just a kid, but a little kid that was killed, you know, and that and that just seemed to be something that was was an emotional point for me in the case. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing, you know, I mean, you can't take human nature and human feelings out of something like that. Oh, absolutely not. Because I can, I can look back at the trial transcript and say, how could these guys find them guilty? But you throw in, yeah, you throw in the bloody pictures, you throw in the bloody clothes, you throw in maybe how you view these guys when they were sitting in court. Were they looking angry? Were they looking guilty? Yeah, and I, you know, and that's funny that you mentioned that because I, I think they held themselves well in court. I don't think they did anything, you know, because I, I think that it might even been brought up at some point, like. They, you know, they didn't look angry, they didn't look vicious, they didn't look, they just kind of were there. So I don't think that that swayed anything either way. Um, yeah. That it, were, it really just came down to, to they spent t 10 hours telling us why, that, why they did it, and some guy spent one hour saying, those guys are liars. And that was it. You yeah. know, it, it was, it, so much of it was what was not there. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, it really is. And and I told you, the, I think I told you the story that um, uh, Boyer, P. Boyer, their attorney, um, <coughs> when that guilty verdict was read, he uh, and they had cleared the courthouse. He like left his briefcase, his coat. He walked away from criminal law. Oh wow! No, I didn't know that. Yeah, he uh, he lived up in Sylvania, which is. I mean, you probably know it's like 10 minutes away. Yeah. But he drove around for two hours, three hours. The bailiff finally called him and said, hey, you left your stuff here. He's like, I know, I'll get it. And he came back, never did, never took another murder or criminal case. So he does he like just, personal injury now. He just thought that was going to be the one that, uh, just that, he thought, that it was going to be that easy. He thought that, that these guys, it's so clear that they're but innocent. He, but he didn't do a good job at pointing out what wasn't there. You know, I right. think in hindsight, if, and even reading, like I said, I read back through everything. You know, never once did he say, there's no murder weapon, there's no blood, there's no this, there's no that. It just was the same story over and over. It was, this guy's a liar, this guy's a liar. Well, we know he's a liar, but is he lying now? Right. You know? Yeah, I get that. I mean, I totally get that. And that was why Carl was frustrated, Donna was frustrated. Um, Donna said that, you know, she went to Boyer and said, put me in the stand. I know where Carl was. And he's like, look, Donna, we don't need you. These guys have presented nothing. They got a child rapist testifying against them. There's no reason for you to even go up on the stand. And even that, I mean, it's not like he even presented that well, you know. I know. <laughs> and, you know, and Carl said something, and it was, you didn't see this part of it, but it's actually pretty striking in the interview. I'm like, okay, so they offered, so the story is that Travis offers you 200 bucks to lay this kid out, to kill him. He's like, yeah, 
two hundred dollars. Well, and that's what like I said, going back and reading it, it all a lot more makes sense. But when you're in that moment, yeah. Oh know, no, I no, I get it. Even like something as simple as like the prices he said for drugs, and now knowing like drugs wasn't the thing. Right. You know, I remember us saying like, "This guy's the worst drug dealer ever." Well, that's, like, what I, <laughs> that's what I was thinking of reading him because he's talking about like an eight ball or a six, eight ball, right? Eight ball, yeah. For like, which, which is like for like a hundred bucks. Yeah. Yeah, which is like cocaine, but then but he's then saying marijuana that he for four hundred. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so I'm reading back over that, and I remember having that discussion, and and, and it just being like, well, how's that relevant? You right. Know, like, right. Okay, he's a he's the worst drug dealer. He's the worst drug dealer ever, but how's that relevant? It like, makes we sense still have experts. Lost, yeah. We still have experts saying that. What his story was matched up. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But Carl said, he said, do you think I'm going to kill a 13-year-old kid for 200 bucks? I said, what's 200 bucks? That's like gone, just like that. That gets me nothing. I'm just going to kill a 13-year-old kid? He said, all my nephews and nieces at that point were like 13 years old. I can't imagine hurting a kid. Yeah. And, and that's what I said, reading back over it, and that's, you know, that's one of the biggest reasons I agreed to do this, is like, reading back over it, it's a lot more clear, but at the time, it was, it was not. And it makes me yeah. mad. It doesn't make me mad for what you did. It makes me mad for what the defense did, and how they said, it made me mad when, the, when Boyer said, I didn't put Carl on the stand because he's not exactly smart. Yeah. I mean, I'm like, you're kidding me. The guy wanted to testify and say, I didn't do this, and you didn't put him on the stand because he's dumb. Well, and, and, and again, it's not even just putting him on a stand. It's, it's he felt like he didn't need to mount a defense. Like, they don't have anything, so I don't need to defend them. Well, what you're failing to realize is if you don't present anything, then they do have something now. Right. So because the fact that he didn't give them anything is why they did have something. Because it looks like they have something. Because if they would have presented anything at all, they would have contradicted it. But yeah. they didn't contradict it one bit. And it puts in your mind that, okay, so what are they hiding from us? Why don't they want? Absolutely. Like, why are they not taking the stand? Why, are they, why don't they have a defense? Why don't they have an alibi? Why don't they have a character witness? Why don't they have a anything at all? Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, thank you, John. I appreciate it. 